The story is told of an outstanding actor who was asked to entertain one evening at a huge uh, dinner party. And as the great actor arose to speak, the room was filled with excitement as the eager guests anticipated his message. So the superstar of the day said that he was going to recite the 23rd Psalm. This he did in a dramatic and eloquent manner. And as soon as he had finished, the chamber roared with applause as the audience stood up, gave him a standing ovation. And then the next speaker of the evening was an elderly white-haired man who was bowed and feeble. He was worn by many long years of uh, missionary service, <clears throat> steadfast, patient labor. Missionary service is tough, beloved. A hush fell over the audience as he arose. And after a moment's silence, he said humbly, I too would like to recite the shepherd's psalm. Then lifting his face slightly toward heaven, he closed his eyes and that old, older, feeble missionary recited Psalm 23. When that precious servant of God was finished, a pin could have been heard if one had been dropped on the floor. This time, there was no applause. There was no standing ovation. Not a sound was heard. Yet through the room, there was not a dry eye. Tears were flowing freely amongst the crowd. Beloved, that's the difference between having Scripture in your head and not in your heart, right? That's also a sign of what is produced in legalistic people. They don't have Scripture in their heart, and actually if they do, they add to Scripture, right? That's the danger of legalism. So last week, if you were uh, with us, we saw three courageous moves as it relates to fixing legalistic churches, we saw that God's man establishes his authority, he establishes his theology, and he establishes his morality. Authority is established in chapters 1 and 2, which we're going to go deeper today, all right, in those two chapters. He establishes his uh, uh, theology, chapters 3 and 4, and then on the back end, he establishes his morality, which morality is what? It's just applied theology, right, in chapters 5 and 6. So last week I had three... Um, um, courageous moves. Today I have six. I've got six bold steps. And if you did not hear uh, the message from last week, I want to encourage y'all to get that. That's where I get my. Uh, you see the you see the Greek word there in my title: fixing anatos legalistic churches. Do you know what that Greek word anatos means? If you do, say it out loud. <laughs> Stupid. That's what it means. And I'm getting that from, I'm not trying to be rude when, I, uh, when I'm using that. That's actually the word that the man of God uses, inspired by God, not once, not twice, uh, uh, actually twice, <laughs> in Galatians chapter 3, right? When we study this, I won't belabor the point, but that's where we get it, okay? And he calls Christians, not just a local church, but an entire region, okay? An entire region of churches in Galatia. Oh, you stupid Galatians, okay? And so uh, the emotive language in this letter is not found anywhere else in the New Testament. All right? So please, go ahead and if you haven't, go listen to last week's message just as, a, an, as an overview of the entire letter. Okay? One of the things we should be taken away by that strong language is to be legalistic is to be senseless. Okay? To be legalistic is to be dumb it's to be unintelligent, or we could use the word uh, stupid. In the J.B. Phillips New Testament translation, J.B. Phillips was an Anglican. Have you ever heard of that translation before? J.B. Phillips, anybody wave at me? Yep, okay, some. Right, in that, don't, don't look up Galatians 3.1 uh, in that translation. You know how he translated? Oh, you idiot, uh, you idiot Galatians. He uses the word idiot, okay? So <clears throat> that's, that uh, reveals... To be legalistic is to be dumb. It's not, it's not good. All right. So here's a little bit of the background, and then we'll go right to the six bold moves. Okay? This might be Paul's first letter. Scom uh, commentators and scholars, they go back, they play their uh, ping pong back and forth as to what Paul's first letter is. It's debatable. It might be uh, actually First uh, Thessalonians. 
uh, but it's either probably that one or Galatians. So this is early in Paul's life. It's not addressed to a local church, like to the church in Rome, to the church at Corinth, right? To the church at Thessalonica. It's to the churches in entire region in Galatia. Maybe uh, next week I'll show you a map on where Galatia is, okay? Um, what this means is that legalism is very appealing. It's very influential, so much so that entire churches are in danger of believing a perversion of the gospel. In fact, it's so dangerous, it's so subtle, uh, subtle it's so enchanting, this legalism is, that the apostle Peter got caught up in it. And we're going to see that in just a few moments together. So, how can we detect legalism in our lives or in our relationship with the Lord, right? Do we have some legalism floating around in this church? Do we have some legalism being taught in the community groups or in the home groups? How would you know? How would you know? Are you by default, not necessarily, okay, children, let's be legalistic. No, are you by default as a parent teaching little, uh, legalism in the heart of your little ones, your children? Now, before we go any further, let's define what we mean by legalism, okay? Legalism is when we add to God's word in order to gain or maintain God's favor. That's worthy of writing down. Legalism, if we're going to push back on this thing, if we're not going to be seduced by it, like these churches are or were and like Peter was, legalism is when you add to the word of God in order to gain God's favor or maintain God's favor. Okay? All right, let's get to the six bold steps, and I'll try to go through these very quickly. All right? Number one, God's man establishes his authority to address legalistic churches. That's what he's doing broadly in chapter 1 and 2, but here I'm highlighting it uh, out of the gate, verses 1 through 5. Let's look at it. Paul, an apostle not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our, uh, our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen and amen. Isn't that beautiful? So out of the gate here, he's establishing his authority. He can't get past verse 1, if you would, as it relates to this letter. He has not been sent from men. He has been sent by God through Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, this is the Christ who is raised from the dead. Okay? He's establishing his authority to fix the mess. And beloved, if you and I are ever going to fight legalism in our lives, we better appeal to the only authority that has the power to destroy it. Amen? In other words, what are, you, what are we relying on to destroy legalism in our lives? What authority are you appealing to? Well, we can appeal to this letter, right? We appear, appeal to the Word of God. Another outstanding fact in these first five verses is what's not mentioned in the beginning. Okay, I mentioned this last week. You may recall this. There's no commendation, not condemnation. There's no commendation at all in this first letter in the beginning, in the salutation. When you read other letters, Paul has an introduction very similar to, to verses 1 through 5. And part of the introduction is, hey, I want to commend you for this. Hey, I want to commend you for that. Even the church at Corinth had a commendation. And that place was really a mess, right? No commendation. No affirmation at all. He's getting right to the point. And that leads us to number two. God's man expresses his perplexity regarding legalistic churches. Verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. If you write in your Bibles, you might want to circle that word amazed. 
right? It's used 43 times in the New Testament. The Greek equivalent is, it means to be in wonder. It means to be in astonishment. For example, do you remember that one time in the life of Christ and his disciples where Jesus was hungry and he went to a fig tree and he's looking for figs on the fig tree and there's no fruit on it? What did Jesus do? Booyah, he curses it. (laughs) And immediately this tree withered. And it says in Matthew 21, seeing this, the disciples were amazed. Same Greek word. Same Greek word that Paul uses here in verse 6. They were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? Well, the answer was Jesus zapped it. Amen. Yeah, when Jesus is hungry and you're a fig tree, you better have some fruit on you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, dear. Shall I apply it even further? That's also true of Israel. He found none, right? And Judaism found none. There's coming a day when Jesus is going to examine our lives. Is he going to see any fruit in our lives? Amen. Not that there's a lot of legalism in in our lives. No, no, no. No. Back to verse 7. The distortion of the gospel is seen in other ways. In other words, as a pastor, sometimes it's hard to bridge what's happening in the first century and what's happening in our modern day. Right? It's hard to do that sometimes, to stand between those two worlds. And so the whole circumcision thing may not hit us. Right? Not a big deal. Sorry, I don't struggle with circumcision in my life with Jesus. You know what I'm saying? So in the first century, it was a big deal regarding circumcision as it relates to Jews. Yeah, you can have Jesus, and you better be circumcised as well. And guess what, beloved? They're running around with Bible verses all up in it, proving that that's true. They got a lot of Bible to back up Jesus plus circumcision. And, and uh, the Apostle Paul will not have it. Will not have it. So for the first century, it was circumcision. For our century, I was thinking, what is uh, akin to it? And what happened, or what came to my mind was things like financial giving. Financial giving. The health and wealth gospel distorters have exchanged circumcision for financial gifts. I mean, have you ever, well, I hope you don't, but do you listen to a lot of Christian preaching on television? Okay? They say, you want to be blessed by God? You want his favor? Then send me 99.99 and he will bless you nine times over. Amen. (laughs) What? Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it in Jesus' name. Amen. Exercise your faith and give even if you don't have money. The health and wealth preachers are the descendants of these gospel distorters. And look what God's man does with his authority with people who distort the gospel. Number three, God's man utters a curse upon gospel distorters. Picking up in verse eight, do you still have your Bible open? I heard three people. Thank you. God bless you. You're encouraging to me. Do you still have your Bible open? You look at God's word as you hear the man of God preach. Amen. Whether it's me or any other uh, cracked pot. Amen. Have your Bible open, beloved. See if what that man is saying is true or not. Amen. Verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Greek word, anathema. Does that sound like language to you from a guy who is cool, calm, and collected? No, I don't think so. No, Paul is not only in shock, Paul is angry because of the legalism, as we saw uh, in verse 6 and now in 7 and 8. When I say, I didn't say hangry. Y'all know what hangry is, right? Not hangry, angry. Just straight up anger, okay? In fact, Paul is so heated, he's so upset, he repeats the curse a second time. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he can go to hell. That's what it means. He 
must be damned. He is to be accursed. So the man of God utters a curse upon gospel distorters. So if you have in your mind that all curses are bad, you need to dispense with that and dispel that. Because here you have a spirit-filled uh, man of God uttering a curse on gospel distorters. Do you not think when this letter was rolled out in all of those churches that this verse 8, they didn't have verse numbers back then, but when it got to this point in the letter that it reverberated throughout the region of Galatia, oh yeah, oh yeah, Paul's dropping the theological bomb on them. Now, I'd like to further expand on what Paul means when he curses gospel distorters. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to slow down a little bit and camp here for a little while. Okay? So sit back and don't relax. Amen. Okay? When you look up the many passages that Jesus and his disciples reveal about hell, three main pictures emerge. And here I'm drawing from the excellent work from Christopher Morgan in a book that I recommend you get called Hell Under Fire. Okay? The New Testament has a lot to say about this doctrine. In fact, th this is important. Every New Testament author teaches about hell or addresses hell. Every New Testament author. Okay? In fact, I have a chart here that shows you the many passages of Scripture as it relates to hell in the New Testament. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. So what I'd like to do is go through each one of those at this time. We'll order some pizza and maybe get out by 6 p.m. today. Okay? No. No, we're not going to do that. When you look all those up, three, per, three pictures emerge, okay, regarding the New Testament doctrine of hell. But today, the doctrine of hell is being deconstructed and it's being redefined by supposed Christians, by supposed Christian preachers, and by supposed Christian scholars. Hear me, and hear me well, beloved. Listen to the so-called Christian scholar, Mr. Dr. Edward Fudge. Quote, the fact is that the Bible does not teach the traditional view of final punishment. Scripture nowhere suggests that God is an eternal torturer. It never says the damned will writhe in ceaseless torment or that the glories of heaven will forever be blighted by the screams from hell. The idea of conscious everlasting torment was a grievous mistake, a horrible error, a gross slander against the heavenly Father whose character we truly see in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Seems like to me, Edward Fudge is fudging just a little bit. In fact, he's not even fudging. He's, he's not fudging on Jesus and fudging on Scripture. It's worse than fudging. He is saying that what Jesus says about hell is a mistake. A horrible error a gross slander against the Heavenly Father? So let's look at these three pictures that Dr. Fudge is fudging on. Amen. Next slide. When you look all those up, this is what you get. Number one, picture number one, hell is a place of punishment. Picture number two, hell is a place of destruction. Picture number three, hell is a picture or a place rather of banishment. Now let's take each of those very quickly or actually not quickly, and move on. Hell as a place of punishment depicts God as judge. God's a judge, right? Do you all know that? Okay. God is the supreme judge of the cosmos, of heaven and of earth. God rightly sentences the wicked to a place of punishment. Out of all the scriptures on hell, guess who is most responsible for the idea that hell is a place of punishment and suffering? Guess who that person is? His name is Jesus. When you look up all those scriptures, who's the one guy, if I could put it that way, that uh, explicitly, clearly teaches that hell is a place of punishment, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. In addition, 
Jesus is the only one who first reveals that hell is a place of eternal fire, quote, prepared for the devil and his angels in addition to those who continue to rebel against God. Revelation 20, verses 10 to 20, is the only other place that I know of in the New Testament that captures both spiritual beings and human beings being thrown into the lake of fire as Jesus spoke in the Gospels. So, when Paul utters a curse on gospel disorders, have that in your head, beloved. He is saying all gospel disorders are going to a place of eternal punishment by fire and rightly so, according to the judge. Two, hell is a place of destruction, pictures God. Uh, in addition to him as judge, it pictures God as a, as a warrior, as a warrior. Here, 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning in verse 6. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Let me stop right there. Do you ever have angst in your life and frustration at the injustices that are put upon you because you're a Christian in a dark, demonic world? Do you ever feel angst at the, uh, the, um, the social uh, ostracization, right? The, um, uh, the mockery, the ridicule, the put down because you love Jesus Christ and are seeking to follow him in a dark world? Well, guess what? Oh, I'm here to remind you that your great shepherd who died for you is taking note of each and every time you have stood for him, you have stood for righteousness in this world and have been in some way diminished or, or, uh, or had bad things happen to you. And when he, when he comes the second time, he's going to put payback, retribution. He's coming as a divine warrior and he's going to destroy each and every one of your enemies outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody, please read the book of the Revelation. God's people are not embarrassed about the doctrine of hell. You know what they're doing? When God finally judges and throws spiritual wicked, uh, spiritual wicked beings and human beings into the lake of fire, guess what they're doing? They're saying, hallelujah! Finally, justice is done. And this is very serious and real. And I find... In my own ministry, and as I try to stay up with the craziness going on on the evangelical world, this doctrine of hell is being deconstructed and redefined. Who cares about if hell is not a place of eternal conscious suffering, if it's a place where, as some say, well, yeah, it's a place of fire, but eventually you're snuffed out. How is that alarming to sinners? Right? In fact, I'm such a dirty, rotten count, uh, uh, sinner. I might be, you know what? I'm going to go for all the gusto because I know at the end of the day, I'm going to be snuffed out. So let's have at it. You tell me that this is eternal, conscious suffering without end? You have my attention. God is not only perfect judge, he's the all-powerful warrior who defeats his enemies. Have that in your mind when Paul curses gospel distorters. God is going to destroy them if they do not repent for distorting the gospel. Very quickly, number three, hell is a place of banishment. You probably know this verse, Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what? The will of my Father. Words are not enough. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Not enough. He who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them. This is Jesus Christ speaking. I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. So that's a picture of what? Banishment. Depart from me. Now, because God is everywhere, there's no place in the cosmos that God cannot be. I want to remind you that though there are depictions of hell being a place where God is not, okay, let's clarify that. Hell is a place where God is not in, the, in relation to his blessed presence. 
In fact, what makes hell hell is the fact that God is there, and he's there for one purpose, and that's to punish in all of his omnipotent might. This should scare the Hades out of you, amen. This should cause every sinner to run to Jesus today, amen. Have this in mind when Paul says, if anybody's teaching a different gospel than me, let him be accursed. Let him be banished from the blessed presence of God forever. It is not a light thing, beloved, to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ by adding it in order to gain or maintain favor with God. All of the other religions of the world is do, 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 do. Christianity, apart from that, done. Done in Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you believe that, beloved? Praise God. Now, before we move on to number four of the, uh, the bold moves here, I want to share some more about these three pictures of hell very quickly. Hell is a place of punishment shows that sin is guilt or crime or trespass, right? Hell is a place of destruction <clears throat> or uh, death, is related to sin as spiritual death or spiritual opposition, right? All of us outside of Christ, we are in opposition to God, right? And then hell as a place of banishment seems to show sin as an alienation from God. And against this black backdrop shines the inestimable gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ took our place on the cross. He took our punishment. He took and drank the cup of what? God's Kool-Aid? No, he, he drank the cup of God's what? Wrath, right? Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He died for us. Jesus Christ experienced separation and, or alienation from the Father as he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you what? God forsaken or at least felt forsaken because he's, uh, he's doing the will of the Father. God sent the Son. He's doing the will of the Father. There's no wedge between what the Father and Son are doing in that moment on the cross, and yet he's crying out, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus did for us, for me, we who are so unworthy of that. And this is why Paul is so, can I say the word, emotional? This is why Paul is so upset. This is why Paul is angry. There's gospel distorters messing up the good news of Jesus. Don't add anything to the gospel. It is enough. Did Christ not say from the cross, it is finished? One Greek word, paid in full. Praise God. This will make a dead Baptist shout hallelujah and amen. Maybe start dancing in the aisles. We'll have to calm them down. Everybody will be in shock. Amen. Get your hands up when you're worshiping the Lord a little bit higher. Get your hands up as you worship the Lord a little bit higher. You know, in the Old Testament, you know when they offered the, the grain offering? You know what they would do? Sometimes it's called the wave offering, right? As it would ascend, it would go like this. Or am I conflating it with the burnt offering? I can't remember. Anyways, it's the wave offering, and they would go like this. They would go like this before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all don't look blessed by that. I think that's fantastic. Don't you tell me how to worship, preacher. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Amen. I'm trying to get you ready for heaven. Soccer field's down that way if you want to go. Paul wants to nip the legalism garbage in the proverbial bud in all these churches in danger. Number four, God's man reveals his motive for fixing the legalistic mess. Does Paul need anger management class, right? What's going on in his life? 
Does he have problems at home? No, he's single. He's not married. Okay, what, what is going on here? Right? Well, look at his motive. For, look at his motive right on the heels of the curse. Look at verse 10. Right on the heels of the curse, verse 10. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still try, uh, trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You see his heart? You see his motive? It's beautiful. Man, what a, what a model for all of us to follow. Number five, God's man tells his testimony. Saved and called by Jesus Christ himself. Now, I want to make sure we get this, so I'm just going to read verses 11 through 24. It's an illustration of itself. This is just beautiful, so let's just look at it together. All right, hear it as I read. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. He said that in verse 1, right? For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Let me just stop right there. You can't stop the church of the living God. It's supernatural in origin, that is, in the Trinity, the triune God himself. You can't stop the church of God. And I was advancing, verse 14, in Judaism, beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia. And return once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went to seminary. And then, oh no, sorry. Usually seminary is three years. Yeah, it's like being in a desert, let me, let me tell you. Sometimes it's five or six years, amen. Three years, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas. Who is Cephas? Peter, right? Stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other, any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and uh, Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. Okay, now why is this important? Listen, Paul did not have someone tell him the gospel like you and me. Paul did, did not have um, someone share with him a tract or sent him a tract like Pastor John's beautiful testimony where he doesn't know who sent him a tract. Somebody did, right? He didn't get saved at a revival service. No one knocked on his door and shared the gospel with him. No Sunday school teacher taught him the gospel. There was no famous apostle he could point to that declared the gospel to him. How did he go from being the world's greatest champion of legalism to the apostle of Jesus Christ? This is how. Jesus Christ himself visited him one day. Literally. Wow. Wow. Do you have a, a similar testimony in your life? Not, not as Paul here, but in the sense that your life has been changed by God through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we heard today from our brother Ryan. You've been changed. Do you have that? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Number six, God's man confers with other men of God regarding the nature of the gospel. God's man confers with other men of God regarding the nature of the gospel. Now, chapter 2, Paul writes about his second trip to Jerusalem, and it also involves the uh, rebuke of Peter, unfortunately. In verses 1 to 10, he talks about the reception that he had in Jerusalem. By the way, he, he's bringing Barnabas with him. What does Barnabas mean? Remember, remember? Son of encouragement. Okay? He's bringing Titus, who's a Gentile, and they didn't make him be circumcised. 
Uh, verse 2 is kind of interesting. It tells that he went to Jerusalem based on a revelation. Now, we're not told what that revelation is. Maybe God sent an angel. Maybe it was the Lord himself again. But the reason why he goes to Jerusalem is because of a revelation. Which, me, which to me, like reading the context, points to things are still not good in Mother Jerusalem. Okay? You recall when we went through the book of Acts that the progress of the church got stuck in Jerusalem? You remember that? They, they didn't have the mission in front of them. They uh, got uh, uh, happy and content with being in Jerusalem when Jesus Christ said, go and make disciples of all the nations, right? And so what did God do to the church at Jerusalem? He sent persecution. And then as, as, as Christians fled, they brought the gospel with them. The reason for the visit was to confer with the other Christian leaders concerning Paul's message and his ministry. And it's interesting, note verse 6, if you would look at that with me, verse 6. But from those who were of what? High reputation. Who do you think he's talking about? We don't know. Is it the Judaizers, the gospel distorters, or is it Peter? Is it the other? Is it James? Right? We all tend to, uh, as people, you know, want to uh, uh, respect, and sometimes that respect turns into a, uh, a not good... Uh, kind of like a Christian groupie thing. You know, it was like, oh, this preacher, he's like so awesome. He's just so awesome. Maybe that was going on in Jerusalem. But look at verse 6. But from those who are of high reputation, what they, makes, uh, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. <laughs> he didn't learn a thing from these big boys, the big hot shots in Jerusalem, whomever they are. I didn't learn a thing from them. Now drop down to verse 16. I want to highlight this every week we're in Galatians. Verse 16, chapter 2. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through what? Faith in Christ Jesus. Even as we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith, by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Three times it's not by the works of the law, not by the works of the law, not by the works of the law. Two times, it's by faith in Jesus, by faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jump down to verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. There's three crucifixions in verse 20. Three crucifixions. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of Christ, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Why are you teeing up circumcision? Why did Jesus die? Well, do you remember the story that I began with? Right at that great banquet and the professional actor, he recited Psalm 23. You remember that? And then the older missionary came out, feeble old man, and then he recited Psalm 23, and you could hear a pin drop. You remember that? Well, shortly afterward, a man approached the outstanding actor, and he said, I don't understand. You both said the same thing. Your presentation was perfect in every way. This was to the actor. Yet when he spoke in his halting, imperfect manner, people were moved too, uh, too deeply for words what made the difference, Mr. Professional Actor? He hesitated and then replied, The answer is simple. I knew the 23rd Psalm, and I knew it well, but he knows the shepherd. He knows the shepherd. You may know church, but do you know the God who makes the church? You may know religious things and moral things, but do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go, out, go in and out and find pasture. Amen. Are you part of the flock of God? Let's pray together.